Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! At the moment, it might feel like Brexit is the only thing occupying the government's thoughts, but evidence that other issues still cut through will come tomorrow when the Environment Secretary and the Health Secretary meet city mayors from across England to discuss the country's air quality. The mayors will be lobbying Michael Gove to give them more funding and support to reduce pollution in their cities. And the government has signed up the UK to be the first major economy to adopt air quality goals based on World Health Organization recommendations going far beyond EU requirements. But with claims that toxic air causes 40,000 premature deaths a year, and the Health Secretary is saying it poses the single greatest environmental threat to human health, is enough being done? Here's David Grossman. Cycle through any UK city and chances are you'll notice the air. You have to keep vigilant for the cars, the buses and the lorries. But what about the dangers you can't see? My journey into work is supposed to keep me fit, but what if it's not? You can certainly taste the pollution in more or less every breath on the way in here. You wonder sometimes, is this doing me more harm than good? Is the government really doing enough now to make the air we breathe safer and healthier? In fact, 37 out of 43 monitoring zones in the UK failed to meet EU limits for nitrogen dioxide. That's a compound produced in diesel engines that's damaging to human health. Mayors from several UK cities, including Liverpool, are heading to London tomorrow to ask the government for help. On occasions now in families, it's three and four vehicles, and so the sheer volume of traffic, and of course that means that there's a lot more congestion, which means there's a lot more vehicles running their engines and being idle in city centres that are then adding to, to the fumes. And we've got a, a real increase in the numbers of young people and elderly people that are getting serious respiratory problems. And the levels are bad. It's six years ago this Friday that Ella Kissy Deborah died. She was nine years old and had suffered a severe asthma attack. The family's home, just 25 metres from one of London's busiest roads. Her mother, Rosamond, says that Ella's hospital admissions, more than 30, corresponded with spikes in air pollution. We actually watch her choking to death. The sadness is always going to be that she is not here to fully understand what happened to her. But also, let's look at the impact of air pollution on children's health. Let's be quite frank about it. It's now between 10 to 15 percent of children in London, which is about three to four in every class. Um, it's all over the country, all the urban cities. The family are now trying to have a new inquest for Ella, one that they hope will recognise air pollution as the cause of her death. The coroner concluded that some of her triggers were due to something in the air. And I'm not even now going to pretend I was thinking about air pollution then. I was thinking pollen because she was severely allergic to tree pollen. So you can see, you know, my train of thoughts at, at the time. And it was a member of, of the public, to which I have to thank, I don't know who that person is, who wrote in to me via the foundation and told me to have a look at the pollution levels the day before she passed away and that for me got the ball rolling. In April London is bringing in an ultra low emission zone, a new charge to discourage drivers from coming into the centre of the city but Ella's family say that's not enough. The Mayor of London will not be able to charge his way out of this crisis. He's going to have to do a bit more than, than that. That is a start, the ultra-low emission zone, because people will be wondering why I'm, I'm not mentioning it. It is not a solution to the problem. Why is it not a solution? It's not a solution because it's a bit like when the congestion charge first started. Initially, there were less cars on the road, then suddenly people got used to it, didn't they? It is better to clean up the air. But local politicians say they can't make the profound changes needed on their own. We've really got to try to address the issues of connectivity within cities, connecting communities or without using diesel vehicles and cars and petrol. It's about supporting electrification of cars as well, put more electrical charging points in cities, but allowing us the powers to do things like stopping cars coming into the city centre on certain days and doing things like that. So we need powers, but we also need some funding as well from central government. 
But are politicians prepared to be brave and are we prepared to let them? The recent protests in France were caused in part by anger at green fuel taxes. Change on this scale won't be easy. David Grossman will join me now as Friends of the Earth Clean Air campaigner Jenny Bates and Matthew Pershars, the former advisor to Boris Johnson, who now works for companies working for an alternative energy supplies. Good evening to you both. Hello. Uh, first of all, you heard there Rosamond Kissy Deborah saying mm. politicians need to be brave enough to get people out of their cars. Absolutely. We do. We need fewer vehicles as well as cleaner ones. And the government isn't tackling that, sec you know, that half of the problem, the whole thing about actually having fewer vehicles, which they need to do. But that is a very radical thing, what you're actually saying. Are you saying to people that perhaps they shouldn't be allowed in a family to have more than one car or that they should car share? Or are you actually going to force people out of their cars? Well, if we give them alternatives, if the, if the alternatives are easy, affordable, safe, you know, good cycling, free public um, uh, buses is what we're thinking of for, for under 30s at least. It needs to be as radical as that if it's going to solve the problem in time. Um, well, I think that's a longer term solution is to address the number of vehicles on the road. How uh, much longer term? Well, it, you saw some of the anger in France. You need to, um, I would say the best way to do it is to change the whole tax system on vehicles. The government has a number of problems it needs to address. One is around air pollution and accelerating cleaner vehicles. But also is, uh, there's also the huge drop in um, revenue from motoring taxes because as they get cleaner, you're going to see VED, car duty, uh, road tax Yeah, but they make a lot of money out of the car industry down. as well, don't they? And that's the other problem. I mean, you've both got the road tax, you've got the car industry. So how, that's going to create some big hole in the Treasury's budget. Well, exactly. So that's why um, I would suggest that how you can hit several of these public policy problems with one stone would be to switch away from the current um, tax raising system to a road user charging scheme which involves emissions. We have the technology to do this now. It's not like it was 10 years ago when the Blair government talked about it and got frightened off by, the, I think, the biggest petition um, in UK history. I think we've grown up a bit since then. It can be talked about around air pollution, around but cleaning up vehicles. We support that too. Te sorry. Yes, we support uh, road user charging or pay-as-you-go driving, um, but that is certainly in a slightly longer term. But we need, we need immediately, we need these clean air zones like the ultra-low emission one in London. We think that should be bigger, come in sooner, and more around the country as well. But, that, but what about road building? I mean, do you want to call a halt to road building? Absolutely, yes, because you know we cannot add to the problem with this multi-billion pound uh, plans that the government currently have. Um, well, I, there's going to be no major road building program as there was in the 60s, 70s, mm. 80s. I think there I are places on, there are some places in the network, and I can think in London there's a Blackwall Tunnel, which I was involved in at City Hall, where it is the one of the major pinch points, the entire network, it's and not the would need some relief there. But look, we've got a situation now where we've got an environment secretary who is now saying, thinking probably post-Brexit, we're actually going to go for WHO uh, targets instead of EU standards because they're more stringent. Surely that's exactly what you want. It is, although that isn't co a complete commitment at the moment. They're looking at getting half halfway there so far. But yes, that is where we have to go. It needs to be enshrined in the Environment Bill, World Health Organization standards. It's particularly important for these very fine particles that can get literally deep into but your lungs and bloodstream. Do, do you think the problem is that we actually, I mean, it's actually going to be the next generation who are actually going to be campaigning all over the country on Friday, who actually understand the severity of this. And we have the rapporteur from the UN saying that something like, what is it, 50,000 people's lives are going to be shortened, premature deaths yes. in the next 20 or 30 years because of air pollution. We can't afford not to be radical. Uh, well, there are a series of radical things you can do, from the very small ones, such as the government was talking about removing red diesel um, uh, tax exemptions for construction mm. uh, fuel, for example. This is doing that would uh, incentivise uh, the um, some clean tech, so you get more battery storage, better technologies on construction sites. The government would get a revenue from that diesel, and we would all have um, better air quality because less diesel would be burnt. It's a it's a it's a small example of the kind of fiscal incentive and price points the government should be setting in order to accelerate that transition. But something like school streets is is in a really immediate thing that that would really make a difference. It's children who are worst affected. Their lungs can actually end up not developing properly if they grow up where air is yeah. bad. If you actually restrict the, the, yes. the, the traffic dropping off and picking up at you school... You would have a school exclusion would, zone. That would help. And that would be... That, presumably, you could do quickly now. Yes, Even though it, 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 yeah. 
unless you think that's something that's too small fry. Um, well, I think it's every little counts to uh, quote a major supermarket chain. And um, that's a campaign I'm actually um, been in favour of around my own kids' school um, in London. Um, but it's an example of the small things that need to be done. But there are bigger fiscal things the government can do to really drive forward the transition um, that we need. But, but if something was done that we knew was going to save lives and promote good health, but was economically disadvantageous to the country, would it still be worth doing? Um, well, I don't think... I don't accept the premise of the question, because I think that you can take the action and keep the economy going really very well. So, for example, um, this conference tomorrow, uh, which uh, Michael Gove and the Health Secretary I'm are at, the they're, yeah, they're asking there for a one and a half billion pounds diesel scrappage scheme, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, that could, A, help the car industry. We heard about Ford mm -hmm. and their fears about maybe going elsewhere. You know, the car industry in the UK is suffering because of Brexit, yes, but also because, frankly, they overinvested in diesel. And any help for them, for people to switch away from, yeah. to clean you, you the vehicles would, would help You that. would welcome at least a switch from diesel to petrol, presumably. Well, we, we have to get rid of both for climate change reasons as well. Um, and, and Friends of the Earth research has shown that we actually have to cut traffic levels by 20% for climate reasons. But air pollution costs the UK economy £20 billion every year. So it's a real problem. And congestion costs businesses as, as well. So it, it's a win-win. If we make it cities attractive, where it's easy to walk and cycle and there's good public transport, transport. That also is good for business. You have a cafe society and we, we can make this win-win-win. But these legal requirements are absolute. We have to do it irrespective of cost because it's health. It's absolutely children's health. Thank you both very much. Indeed. Thank you.